And good morning to you all. Lord bless you. Matthew chapter 20. We've been going through the book of Matthew. We have been doing parables in other weeks. Here's another parable. Jesus' wonderful and excellent stories that teach such wonderful truth. Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them out into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard. Now watch this, a little different. And whatever is right, I will give you. Whatever is right, I'll give you. And so they went out. Didn't tell him how much they was, he was going to pay him. And again, he went out the, about the sixth and ninth hour and did the same thing. Verse 6 of Matthew 20. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said, No one hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. No discussion of how much. Money. Verse 8, now when the evening came and the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group first. That's very important. Take note of that. Beginning with the last group first. The ones that only work one hour. Take note of that. But when those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius for one hour. Remember, the other guys worked the whole day for a denarius. Watch this now. And he, remember, the parables always have a punchline really at the end. It's a story, the punchline, and it is usually a main point. So here it is. Verse 10. And when those hired first came, they supposed that they would receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they were grumbling at the landowner, saying, These men have worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat? In other words, are you kidding me? But he answered and said to them, friend, kind of semi-polite but direct here, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give the last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I'm generous? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Aren't Jesus' stories amazing? Even just the reading of it is like, and he just, you know, obviously he just told these stories, and there's so much truth in it. But let's pray. Take a moment to give thanks in your own heart to the Lord. Think about how good he's been to you. I mean, this is a parable about grace, right? Hasn't he been gracious to all of us? Does anyone in here deserve salvation? Nobody. So anyway, we'll get into that. But thank the Lord for his amazing grace, right? And maybe you do have a heavy burden, yet you want to give to the Lord. Lord, we want to be like the deer who pants for the water brooks in that our soul would pan for you. Lord, that, give us that desire to know you better and to have a close relationship with you, the living God. And Lord, for any brother or sister that might be in despair, we know the psalmist said, why are you in despair, O my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? Wait for the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Lord, I ask that you would embolden all of us as we count our blessings, as we think about the amazing grace that came our way through your son Jesus. The price he paid, the forgiveness that you granted to us freely as a gift, we want to thank you for it. And all the more, Lord, help us to understand how undeserving we really were, but you gave it to us anyway. Forgiven, given new life, an ability to understand your word, even a desire to know your word, to read it, meditate on it, and even be in church. 
I thank you for everyone that's here who has been motivated by you to be here. And then, Lord, even for friends and others and maybe those who don't even know Jesus yet, I thank you they're here. And I pray as a result of hearing this very parable of Jesus that anyone here might realize that they too can be a recipient of the grace of God and can trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior and be forgiven even this day. And Lord, we even thank you that you created man in your image. Whether he's a believer or not, you gave mankind such wisdom and intelligence to be able to do these things. We praise you for that. We praise you that we're even able to ride a car to church today. Thank you for the things we have, all the blessings. But I pray we might use even the modern conveniences for your glory. Thank you for those who sang. Lord, I want to thank you so much. So far in the U.S. of A., Lord, you've given us great opportunity, so much freedom. I'm asking that all of us, myself included, we would take advantage of the freedom that you've given us. Lord, to worship, to build each other up, to fellowship more, to get stronger in you, and to witness a lot more, and to make many more disciples. So, Lord, I'm asking for that. Energize all of us to do this. And I pray even as we hear what Jesus said, that we would be more enthusiastic about all those things. And I ask for this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I know most of you know the story of Cinderella. It's a classic fairy tale. And you know how it goes. There's a very likable young lady, right? Even in the cartoon version, isn't she? She's a nice young lady. But she's mistreated by who? Her stepmother and her stepsisters. They're very evil looking, right? But it ends up, and I'm not going to tell the whole story now, but I'm just reminding you, she ends up attending a, a, a royal banquet, and she catches the eye of a prince. But he has to, like, find her before midnight, something like that, right? He has to find her before midnight, and it all works out. This abused foster child becomes a princess. It's a beautiful reversal, right? Beautiful reversal. What about another one? Story of the Ugly Duckling. I think that was Hans Christian Andersen. Very creative writers, right? And wasn't it that a mother duck hatches an egg and one baby is perceived by the others as ugly? The Ugly Duckling, right? And ends up living with wild ducks and geese, is kind of, you know, ostracized, right? And then an old woman takes the duck in, and, but the cat and the hen tease the duck, right? And then a farmer takes the duck home and then for some reason has to flee that, the duck has to flee that home. But by this time, this uh, ugly ducking, duckling has grew, has grown, I should say, and ends up finding some swans that end up welcoming the duck to be one of them because the duck is a swan. So anyway, another reversal, right? This happens even in real life. You know, as I had read the story of Kurt Warner who was working in a grocery store, for those of you that like football, and here he is, he's a clerk in a grocery store, and he ends up being drafted by a team and becomes a major quarterback in the NFL. That happens. Reversals happen in this life. Things can really change quick. What about in the Bible? I'm sure you could think of some there. What about the story of Joseph? Sold into slavery by his brothers? Eventually, he was even thrown in prison, right? But through a series of events, he becomes second in command. He becomes second in command of Egypt. It's the king of Egypt, right? Prince of Egypt, I should say, which there's another movie for that. So the slave becomes the prince of Egypt with the power to save his family from famine. A reversal. What about Esther? A Jewish minority lady in the Persian Empire. Jews are minorities there. And they were in trouble. Right? They were going to be in trouble. But it just happens in God's sovereignty that the Persian king fires his queen. He fires his wife. He says, get out of here. You're not going to listen to me. You're not going to come out when I want you to come out and, and show your beauty to everybody. You're out. So he holds a beauty contest. Guess who wins? It just happens to be Esther. Jewish minority. She becomes the queen. By God's grace, reversals take place. They do. 
You know, there's some very poor Christians in the world that they look like they're nothing in this world. But what about the next? They could be living in a hut somewhere, praising the Lord, very poor, looking like they're, they're nothing compared to people, say, in our country. And yet in heaven, they might have top place. That's how it works. God's grace. Didn't Jesus say, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first? In fact, if you go to Matthew chapter 19, still by way of introduction here, to get to Matthew 20, take a look at verse 27. Right before this parable of the generous landowner, right? The disciples are going to come to Christ and say, hey, we left everything. Before, even before that, the rich young ruler, who was rich in this world, he refused to take his hands off his riches to follow Christ. Right? Remember he said, sell everything, give to the poor, come follow me. Everybody doesn't have to do that. But that guy, because he loved his riches and he loved his mammon before God, that's what Jesus told him to do. He was unwilling to do it. He was kind of high, high up in this world. Rich, young ruler. Top guy. Top dog. So that makes the disciples think, oh, well, what about it going to be in it for us? We, we're not rich. So Peter says this, verse 27. Peter responded and said to Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and we followed you. What then will be there for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who followed me in the regeneration, when a son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Man, you guys are kind of low economically in this life. But spiritually you're good now and you're going to be real good later. You're going to have top seats. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. And many who are first will be last and the last shall be first. Makes me think of a dear brother that is in my... Um, seminary class, and uh, his name is Matthew, and he's in Thailand. I'm not sure all that he gave up, but I'm, I'm going to get to know him more. But you always wonder about the missionaries, right, who are willing to leave America and go there and live more simply and spread the gospel in a tough land. You know, what's it going to be like for them? Are they better off maybe than the, the big church pastor here, the mega church pastor here? Who knows, right? And then Jesus said this, Many who are first will be last, right? And the last first. I suppose if you sacrifice for Jesus in this world, it's worth it. Don't you think? Great rewards for those who sacrifice for Christ. Well, let's get to the parable of the generous landowner. Verse 1 of Matthew 20. First point. The landowner hires the workers at different times of the workday. That's very important. It's a big, long, 12-hour workday. And he's going to hire some at the beginning of the day. Watch. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. First of all, this is a statement about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is about heaven and salvation. Right? And perhaps the rewards thereof. A vineyard was a common sight back then. Jesus is using something that they understand back then. Maybe those who live out east from here more, there's more vineyards and farms out there than, than in Medford, right? But people who live in these areas, they understand this. And back then, the vineyards were a whole lot of work. It was, you know, there was stony ground. It was digging. You had to make retaining walls and, and pruning. I don't know if you see that Errol and, uh, and even Carl, particularly Carl, they did a lot of hard work over here to... Back here, you got to see it sometime in order to plant plants. A uh, big fence around it and all kinds, of, um, all kinds of areas where plants could be, you know, a lot of work. Same thing, same thing at this time. A lot of work in these vineyards. So the workday would start at 6 a.m. So they would go out, and the landowner here is, you know, going out to find guys to work in his, in his vineyard, right? Because it, presumably it's during harvest time. And 6 a.m. would be the normal time. And there were day laborers. Just like we have men by our 7-Elevens or down North Ocean. Men from some other countries that are looking for a day job, right? They really are. And they need work, I'm sure. 
day laborers who are not able to get full, a full-time work, and maybe they don't have as much. So the landowner makes a deal with them. Look at verse 2. He makes a specific deal. And this is the only group he makes a specific deal with. It's the only group he tells how much he's going to pay him. Watch. And when he had agreed, he agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. One denarius. Actually, it was a pretty good deal. That was the wages for a good day's work. It was a decent deal for guys that don't have much. Pretty good. Let's just say, and we're just going to say for argument's sake, $120 a day. It's not a, not a lot, lot, but, you know, for, for someone who doesn't have any work, it's not bad, right? Not bad. I don't know, about 12 hours of work. Maybe we would, here we would pay 120 for eight hours, maybe, right? Something like that. Who knows? Whatever it is. But let's say we're doing a 12-hour day, because remember, the, the work day back then, 6 to 6. 6 in the morning, 6 at night. All right? So, The landowner finds out that he needs even more men. Verse 3, there are others, different part of the day now. He wants to give an opportunity. Verse 3, he went out about the third hour, 9 a.m. And he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. That doesn't mean they necessarily were, were, were lazy or anything. They just didn't get hired, perhaps. Maybe they weren't as strong as the other guys. You know, you, you can't surmise too many things. It's not said. Be careful with parables. Some pastors will inject, preachers will inject too much in there that's not there. They were standing idle because they were bums. And I don't know. I don't know why they were standing idle. Jesus is just telling a story for a point. You see what I mean? So you don't get too into, you know, trying to make uh, too many details that are not there. They're standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, here's the key part, you go into the vineyard also. And this is key. Whatever is right, I will give to you. He didn't tell them how much, right? They trusted the landowner. Who do you think the landowner is a picture of? It's God himself. It's a picture of God. Very gracious. So he says whatever is right. And he's, he, they know he's going to pay him a fair, that he is going to pay them a fair amount. They're eager to work. And they can trust this landowner. But no, I don't know. Maybe he needs more men or he just wants to be Generous to more men, right? We don't know. Verse 5, and again he went out the sixth and ninth hour and did the same thing. Now you're getting down to like 12 noon and 3 p.m. Getting a little later, right? And he did the same thing. He gave them whatever he felt was right. By the way, can we trust God implicitly? Is God going to deal good with us? Oh, yeah. You can trust them. I can trust them. Trust God. So now, verse 6. And it came about the 11th hour. Now, wait a second. What's the work day? How many hours? 12. So the 11th hour guys, they're going to work how much? Solamente uno. Only one. One hour. About the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing idle all day long? And, he, and they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Were these guys not as market, marketable? You know, were they overlooked? No one hired them. Were they the bad news bears? Were they the motley crew? I don't know. Were they old? Were they weak? We don't know. But they didn't get hired. But... The landowner is like a really nice guy in the parable, right? He's going to hire these guys last minute. It's really good of him. So what do we know so far? The landowner hires the workers at different times of the workday. But now the second point. But I, I won't say the point yet. Verse 8. And he, this, this is the focus here. Watch this. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, some say his foreman, is, the foreman represents Jesus. I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure of that one. You know. But anyway, because you see, sometimes with parables, it gets like that. You kind of play around who's, who's in there. and Oh, it's John the Baptist is the foreman. No, I, yeah, we don't know. He said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, starting with the last group first. He wants everybody to see what the last group's going to get. Because you know what? If he paid the first group first, they would go, and they wouldn't know what the last guys got. 
And that's the whole point of this thing. So watch. Time to give out the paychecks. He starts with the last group. And how much did the last group worth? Because, work because they worked because they came the 11th hour? One hour. All right? You got to get that. When those, verse 9, when those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. Now, wait a second. We just said before, let's just say a denarius for our time would be 120 bucks. How's 120 for one hour? Not bad, right? Pretty good pay. It's above, way above minimum wage, right? So he paid those guys 120. How generous. How kind. Right? But now no one's complaining yet. What, what, what do you think the others might be thinking? Oh boy, the boss is generous today. If he gave those dudes 120, who knows what we're going to get? We might get a thousand bucks. Well, and here's really the punchline, right? And by the way, you know, a landowner pays those hired first and he pays them for a full day. The ones who worked only one hour. Verse 10. So when those who are hired, I'm sorry, the other ones who were hired last, the last were paid only, you know, paid 120, right, for the full day. The last ones hired only work one hour. Verse 10. So when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. Right? Just like I was saying. But each one of them also received one denarius. Now think about that for a second. According to our standards, it's pretty unfair. Right? But technically, watch this. I was just thinking. Let's say somebody hired you, and he, you, know, you got a house, you have other jobs, and this is an extra job for you. And let's say he hires a homeless man, and he wants to pay the homeless man more. You can't, and, and if you agreed... Whatever he was going to pay you, you agreed. The homeless guy is getting the same thing for less hours. Can you really argue if some boss wants to give some guy more? Even in our realm, you would think, well, I mean, the boss can do what he wants. I got contracted for this amount. You know, we're so into fairness, right, that sometimes we don't understand, right? So anyway, but according to our standards, this, you, you wouldn't do this as a boss for similar workers, right? Anyway, but this is a parable, right? This is a parable. This is a story for, for a truth, right? So they only received a denarius. They might have been expecting $1,000, but you know what? They end up, in our little scenario, making $10 an hour, $10 an hour, while the last guys hired got $120 an hour. Verse 11. So now, verse 11 could have said, those who worked the whole day thanked the landowner for what was agreed upon and walked away and were really glad that, that he was generous to the other guys. Doesn't say that, does it? When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, you know, and do these always represent the Pharisees, perhaps? Because you know what? Tax collectors and sinners got saved and were ahead of them. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So anyway, they grumbled at the landowner. A lot of Jesus' parables are, are kind of ranking on the Pharisees, but anyway... Verse 12, saying, those who were hired last worked only one hour. And you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of a day's work? Man, we broke our backs. And it was hot. We were sweating, scorching heat. And you gave them the same amount. It's not fair, Mr. Landowner. It's not fair. They work one measly hour. We're slaving all day in the hot fields. And you give them the same thing? You kidding me? By the way, there may be times that you're serving all day in the church without much help. Just praise God. Don't complain about the others. Oh, the people didn't come today. You ever see that in the church? Don't be like that. Don't you think there are times in the life of the church I maybe felt like that? Oh, but Pastor, you're getting paid to do it. Yeah, all right. But you don't think like that. It's like, I have the privilege of serving all day, let's say, right? You know, we got to, this helps, this parable helps us to think different in a lot of ways. So, the ones who worked at one hour, maybe they could re represent, like I said before, tax collectors, sinners, Gentiles, Johnny-come-latelys, 
Thief on the cross. He got saved last minute, right? Others serve God longer. Some people come to Christ in their 90s. Some people come to Christ when they're nine years old. Right? Think about it. And shouldn't we be happy when others are blessed? Let's say you found out that somebody in the church put their name in a lottery for a house and they got a free house. But then you think, well, what could you be thinking if you worked hard for your house? My word, I worked 20 years to get my house and he got one in a lottery? You see how we are sometimes? Instead of being thankful, rejoice with those. Thank you. And weep with those who weep. What if you're at a, you if you're at a job with a group of believers and somebody gets promoted before you and gets the raise? Can you be happy for them? Or, or as Jesus is going to say, do we got this evil eye, this you know, jealous eye kind of thing? That God has been generous with somebody. I'm ticked that he's been good to some. Stop. Stop right there. We can even look down on other believers. Oh, man, those guys at TLC, they were strung out on drugs on the street, and they did all these crimes, and... Oh, wait a second. They got radically saved, and now they're serving God. It's good. Oh, but I was a good student in school, and I didn't... Know. Is everybody saved by the grace of God. All have sinned and fall short. Nobody's better than anybody in God's sight. We're like a bunch of ants at different heights. You know, we, you know that's it. Look at verse 13. The response is, is really interesting. But he answered and said to one of them, friend. Now, this is the term, not for a close friend, but it's, it's polite, but it's, you know, it's a little direct. Friend, hi, right, friend. I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for denarius? Now, right there, isn't that a pretty good point? The, we made an agreement. There was a contract. You knew you were going to get a denarius. Did I cheat you? Can you take me to court? No. There's no legal case here. You got no case. We agreed for this. I did you no wrong. Then, verse 14, the landowner says, as Jesus was telling the story, take what is yours and go, but I want to give to the last person the same as you. You take what we agreed upon, I want to be generous. I want to be abundant in grace and generosity and give more to those other guys who came late. And on the way out, I tell you this too. Not only that, verse 15, is it not, is it not lawful f for me to do what I want with what is my own? I mean, can we argue with God about anything, really? You know, actually, on the contrary, we should be praising God for a lot of different things. I'll give you an example. You know, I work with people with autism. You know how many times, and even when I pick up Sheila from the airport and she goes there, and I think about the people that I work with, some who can't talk, some whose speech is slow and their processing of their mind is slow. I could have been them, and they could have been me. And I think, well, wait a second. I've got a lot to be thankful for. Are you kidding me? There are people born without limbs, people born blind, people born in families where they were abused. I wasn't abused in my family. My parents weren't the greatest, but they weren't the worst either. And can God bless whoever he wants to bless? And we, can we argue with that? Somebody sings a beautiful song up here like they did this morning. Am I jealous of them? Am I jealous of pastors with bigger churches? We got to really, you know, thank the Lord for what you have and who you are. Sometimes we also got to accept kind of how God made us and what he made us for. And be as faithful as we can because there's reversals, right? You could be a little church pastor. You could be a humble member of a church that serves God well in your job and teaches kids in the Sunday school for 30 years. You might end up getting a bigger reward than some who knows who, right? 
God is a God of reversals, my friends. So anyway, let me finish that verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what I want with my own? Or is your eye envious because I'm generous? Are you jealous? Do you got the evil eye? Oh, why are they doing that? Or why God blessed them with that? Or No, no, get that out. Get that out. Get that out. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. You know, you know in, in 1 Corinthians 13, right? Love is being kind. Love is being, you know, keeps no record of wrongs, all that kind of stuff. But it's not jealous, not envious. And then he says in verse 16, the punchline again. But he reverses it. The last will be first and the first last. By the way, can't God say I can do whatever I want with what is mine? Does God have every right to dispense his grace as he sees fit? Should we want an axe murderer to be saved? The Bible says God desires all men to be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth. I talked to that homeless kid as I was walking to the church this morning, the one that popped in our church at times, tall guy named Tim. He was screaming. He's not in his right way. But when he sees me, he, he calmed down. Oh, hi, hi, how you doing? I don't know, I don't know what's going on in his life. I said, I heard your parents are moving to Florida. He says, I, I, hope, that, I hope they do. I, hope, I can't wait till they go. I hope that house burns down. And he's like, oh. But if he gets saved, it'll be quite a testimony. Everybody knows this guy, kid in the neighborhood. Imagine if he got saved. Would you, would you pray for this? We'll call him Homeless Tim. Pray for this guy. If he gets saved. Did the Gadarean demoniac get saved? That guy was going around, screaming, cutting himself. They were trying to bind him with chains, and what'd he do? He's breaking it, man. He's demon-possessed with a whole lot of demons. And Jesus cast the demons out. And they go into the pigs, and the pigs go into the river. And this guy's now in his right mind. What did Jesus say to him? Like, go home and tell your family what great things God has done for you? This parable helps us with a lot of things. It really helps us also in evangelism, doesn't it? Because God's grace can be poured on somebody like that. And we should desire it. We should desire to bring the gospel to people. When Saul was persecuting Christians, did anyone think, as he was rounding them up to have the Christians killed, did anyone think that he would get radically saved and become the foremost apostle and take three missionary journeys and be one of the main ones to turn the world upside down? Did anybody think that back then? In fact, when he first got saved, people were scared of him. Like, oh man, this guy, you know, who knows what he's about. Let me ask you a question. Do pedophiles, pimps, gang members, drug addicts, and gypsies, tramps, and thieves get saved? Some of you know the song from the old... They could get saved, everybody in that category. And then even your nice neighbor, the guy that works hard, picket fence, takes care of his family pretty well, but rejects Christ, he could get saved too. Don't forget that. Don't just assume because somebody's a nice person, they're good. Everybody needs the grace. The amazing saving grace. What about the child therapist in Newsday? who was, uh, what was she doing, like selling child porn to people? What about the teacher in West Babylon that was, what, a third grade teacher abusing kids for years? Can these guys get saved? It's a lot of reversals. God can give a reversal to you here. You could be somebody that comes to this country with nothing and then he allows you to have successful restaurants. We know somebody like that. But the most important reversals are in the next life. You realize that. Serve him faithfully here. Be generous like God. God's very generous. And by the way, God's estimation of you and I is more important than people. You realize that? People can have the wrong view of you and I, especially the unbelievers. And hey, 
They don't think Christ died and rose from the dead, so to them we do look stupid, and if he didn't rise, we are stupid. But since he did, we're not. Right? Oh, we're the biggest fools if Jesus didn't rise, but he did. Remember a song, When Others See a Shepherd Boy, God May See a King? It was sung by a man by the name of Ray Bolt, and unfortunately he went off the deep end. But the, songs, the song was great, and it was speaking about David. Nobody expected that David would be the king, right? The other brothers were taller and whatever, whatever, right? When others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. So you know, brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, abounding in his work. Be the best you for you for the Lord. And who knows how he'll bless you in this life and especially in the next. Because the first shall be last, the last shall be first. However you want to say it, the last shall be first, the first shall be last. So every one of us, us regular people. And think about it too. Everybody gets the same eternal life. The thief on the cross gets eternal life like the Apostle Paul. And then we know there's rewards and different responsibilities in heaven on top of that. But the parable may also be suggesting the fact that everybody gets the same eternal life. So in some passages would say everybody ended up in a dead heat. In one sense. But as I said before, humble Christians in this life can really be blessed in the next life. Remember that. Let's pray. I'm going to pray that we're among those humble Christians, right? I see nobody rich and famous here. Nobody mighty. But regular people, right? And even you young people. Don't leave the young people out. You can do great things for the Lord. Remember the Columbine thing and that, who was her name? What was her name? Rachel Scott? Oh, she died young, but she went out in style giving glory to God before that shooter got her, right? Rachel Scott. And her father and her parents have been able to do a lot of witnessing because of her. So it doesn't even matter what age you are. You can be committed to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this time. And I am praying that everyone here, well, first of all, everyone here would trust Jesus as Lord and Savior if they haven't to know it's the only way to be forgiven, to know the amazing, saving grace of God is available to them, that they could be forgiven of every sin if they would be honest about their sin, they would agree with what the Bible says their sin is, and then look to Jesus as the Messiah, as God become man, as the one who died to pay for their sin, they would look to him for forgiveness and plead with with him to forgive them because of his death and resurrection and be saved even this day. I pray your grace might be abundant this day towards someone. But I pray as well, Lord, for the rest of us that know you, that we might, um, we might cling to you. We might obey you. Lord, we might... Be holy as you are holy. We might understand more about how great and wonderful you are and how gracious you've been to us and count our blessings and be steadfast and movable in your service and present our bodies as living sacrifices to you. And I pray that each one here would be used of you. Great ways in and outside the church. And help us all to know that your grace is still going around and saving people. And I pray for an evangelistic wave out of our church to the lost. And that sinners would be saved and discipled even by us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.